Hi there, I'm Fred Trost. Welcome to Michigan Weekend. On this edition of Michigan Weekend, we're going to go fishing. Not ice fishing, at least not too much ice fishing. We're going to go bass fishing up in the Sylvania Tract in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Now this is something you ought to put on your calendar sometime in June, July, August. You can catch bass up there. It's so simple, a lot of fun, and really it's a good place to take a kid because you can be so successful at bass fishing. And speaking of taking kids fishing, we're going to go on the Great Lakes with Sam Grissom and his sons. Sam takes his boys out quite a bit. He has a lot of tips on how to teach a kid to fish, help him when he's out there, catch some lunkers. <clears throat> we can learn along with his kids how to catch some big salmon. Catching those big fish sometimes takes a lot of muscles, you know. What better way to get in shape than with barbells? They're on sale this week at Meyer Thrifty Acres. Exercising and physical fitness has really become popular, and it's a good thing. You know, we Americans could stand to be in a little better shape. You know, this week at Meyer, you can buy a 110-pound barbell set just like this for only 1988. That's 110 pounds of weights plus the bars and accessories to make a whole set. This foam padded exercise bench can be yours too for only $19.88. Check out the whole range of exercise equipment on sale this week at Meyer. Hmm, I must be getting stronger already. As fun as ice fishing can be, it's really not for everybody. An awful lot of anglers prefer to wait until the spring and the summer get out when it's warm. Well, we're going to do some bass fishing in just a few minutes here. We're going to go across the straits over to the western end of the Upper Peninsula in the Waters Meat area where we find the Sylvania Tract. This is a wilderness area that has loads of lakes up in there, largemouth and smallmouth bass. Now the fishing is sort of not put and take, but you have to release everything that you catch. You have to use artificial lures only. Now I was on a trip up there last summer with Lori McBurney, his son Scott, Luke Dallas, and Terry McBurney. Now Terry, by the way, is the sporting goods buyer at Meyer Thrifty Acres. He's the guy who buys all of the sporting goods that goes into the sporting goods department. And he's a fisherman too, and this will prove it. Right now I'm going to show you a conversation at the end of a typical day at Sylvania. Terry, uh, it was your idea to go to Fisher Lake today. Um, you told us we were going to catch loads and loads of big bass. Did you say big bass? Lots of bass. Lots of bass. Lots of bass. Yeah, I caught lots of bass. How about the rest of you? Julie? Oh, yeah, I caught more bass today than I've ever caught in my entire life. Is that right? Yep. How many do you suppose you caught? Well, I'd say we caught about 15 or 20 of them there in that one short spot just before lunch. And when they started hitting those topwater baits, that was exciting. I enjoyed that. What did you use? I used that little floating Rapala, uh, a number nine floater, perch color. Mm -hmm. It's just a beautiful sensation to watch them come up and smack that. You're from originally from Indiana? Right, northern Indiana. And you moved here, what, a year ago? Last July. Have you ever been up to Sylvania or up northern Michigan this like this? This is my first trip into the UP, and I'll be back again. This is really exciting. Terry, what did you catch? A lot of small, largemouth bass today. How big? I'd say the biggest that I caught was about 12 inches. I, the, I, measured, I measured one just before we quit. I hadn't measured any all day. Mine was 11 and a half, biggest one. Uh, that got to look pretty big towards the end of the day. You <laughs> can say that again. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask me about the big fish. All I caught today were some moderate and some small ones. Well, geez, well, you had a great time, though. Uh, super time. Well, who, who caught the big fish? Well, who else but uh, Scott. Scott, you caught the biggest one? Yeah. How big was it? About 14 inches. How are we going to prove that he got it, though? We've got a picture of him. We took a snap oh, out of him holding it. Yeah. Super. And uh, we'll have that in a little while. OK, that'll be great. How did that fight? Did that jump? Uh, not much. Huh. No, it stayed underwater quite a bit. The, the big one just stayed down and rolled. Well, what about you, Lori? What did you <clears throat> haul in? We yeah. saw you hauling in a couple. We hauled in quite a few uh, 10, 11 inch, you know, bass. Uh, there was a lot more bass than I've ever caught in one spot before. What were you using? We were using uh, little golden number two MEPS spinners, and uh, they seemed to work quite effectively. What did you find was the most successful? I used a, a, a black popper about the size of your thumbnail, and uh, I caught just all that I could uh, bring in before I got too tired. And uh, it was really exciting. Every largemouth that we got jumped. And uh, the only thing, I wish they were just a little bigger. Mm -hmm. 
Did you notice, it, it seemed to me that the bigger ones, you know, 10, 12 inches, when you felt you really had a big one on, it didn't seem to come out of the water as much as the smaller ones did. Did you notice that? Today, yeah, that's true. Uh, the small ones, every one of them came up, though. Oh, I know. We'd, uh, we'd wait, for the, wait for a bigger one to get the camera rolling. Doggone thing. <laughs> Wouldn't take out of the water like the little ones. You know what we ought to do is stop and take a look at Mama Merganser. Look at yeah. that. Right out there. Jesus, they're look all, at that with all, all riding on her. Right on her back, yeah. yeah. Isn't that amazing? One, two, three, four, five, six small hooded Mergansers on Mama's back. Unbelievable. Oh. We saw today, this was incredible, you know those two loons that were out there? Yeah. We were standing and fishing on a log that was, uh, and the loons came in very close, were hanging around. Bob looked over and said, Fred, that's it. Look, look at over here. There's a loon nest right next to the water. It just had one big loon egg in it, so they, you know, she must have been waiting to lay some more. Looked like a big four-inch piece of sandstone. One of the ugliest eggs I've ever seen. <laughs> but, <laughs> We were over in that corner, and uh, the, the loon came right up to us, and we couldn't figure out why it let us get so close, and what she was doing was protecting her nest. All of us used different lures, and all of us caught a lot of fish. The big question is, though, you know, we did a lot of portaging to get there. We went through a lot of mosquitoes, and, uh, oh, my shoulders still ache from all that paddling and carrying all that gear. Was it worth it? Was it worth it? Absolutely. Why? It was just a beautiful experience. It was just something I've never experienced before. You know, just super back in there, uh, all quiet and uh, watching those fish being caught by everyone. I really enjoyed Terry using that uh, fly rod. Mm -hmm. It was really fun to watch that with that popper. Oh, he, his technique is very good. Yeah, very good. I mean, the way he hits the water on both the forecast and the back cast. <laughs> that, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, he did his. I, uh, Bob filmed me a couple times, and he asked me to cast, and whoosh, whoosh, slapped it all over and caught my jacket. The whole works. But uh, what about you guys? You you thought it was worth it to go back there to catch all those little ones? I think it was definitely worth it. Just like you said, the experience of just going back there and, and the solitude and the peace, and uh, it, it's just a marvelous place. What do you think about the, uh, the rule here that you have to use artificials and you can't keep any of the bass? Well, I think on the big lakes, it's a good rule. I think on some of the small lakes that we've seen, it might not be a good rule because there are a lot of stunted small fish. Of course, then on the other hand, the fact that everybody throws them back and uses artificial, there's uh, not much of a mortality rate on the fish, and there are a lot of them back there for all of us to catch. You know, I think it's a great place, even though the, there are so many small bass back there, but I think it would be a great place for somebody to go back who wanted to practice fly rod fishing, you know, especially kids, women, because uh, you catch a lot of them. And it, uh, that's what I thought was super about it. I got, I got pretty good on my technique by the end of the day. Well, I've fished uh, some of the other small lakes around here, and uh, they too have a lot of small bass, but I've also done very, very well on uh, largemouth up to 18 and 19 inches. So today was, well, not the best day, but a lot of fun. Oh, outstanding. What, well, what's on the tap for tomorrow? Now, tomorrow we're going to portage into Deer Island Lake. and where, that, where is that on the map? That's it's due east of here. And we've got a shorter portage tomorrow. Okay. What are we going to catch? Well, uh, we'll be primarily after smallmouth bass. Well, Terry McBurney showed us he's as good of a fishing guide as he is a sporting goods buyer. And next week on Michigan Weekend, we're not going to be fishing at Fisher Lake. Uh, we're going to go all the way over to Deer Island Lake, where Terry McBurney got us into some three- and four-pound smallmouth bass. That's right. You're going to want to tune in next week and see that. But right now, here's a message about the sporting goods department at Meyer Thrifty Acres. You know, a lot of people ask me, they say, do you really buy your sporting goods at Meyer? Well, you bet I do, and I'll tell you why. Okay, first of all, they have name brand merchandise. Sporting Goods Department has a huge selection, and Meyer has the lowest prices you're going to find. And another thing, you know, if you get to know the Meyer people in the Sporting Goods Department, you're going to find that they're really nice. Well, I did all my Christmas shopping at Meyer. Of course, I know what I'm looking for in Sporting Goods, and, uh, well, if you know what you want, why pay more? 
Well, bass fishing in the Upper Peninsula and the Sylvania Tract might be something you want to put on your calendar for this coming summer. Great place to take a kid because he can be so successful right off the bat. But maybe bass fishing in the UP doesn't exactly ring your chimes. Maybe you want bigger fish? Well, hey, what about salmon? Here's a string of fish that Sam Grissom's kids caught. Sam lives in the Detroit area. He's a fireman, so he gets a number of days off during the summer when he can take his kids fishing. And fishing for salmon doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be difficult. It's a lot of fun, something kids can learn to do, and there's a big thrill in catching a big fish. So let's go fishing with Sam Grissom and his kids right now and find out exactly how he does it. Fish is out there for everyone. You don't need a lot of equipment, a lot of gear. Uh, the more you fish it, of course, the more gear you accumulate, but you can start out rather basic. I think the best thing you need to start out with is a good, comfortable pair of pants, like Levi's or something you're going to be, if you want to wipe your hands on them, you can. Uh, something that's not going to be too warm yet, if it does get a little, little chilly, you do have some protection. You need a good, lightweight shirt, uh, preferably long sleeves, so that you can roll the sleeves up, or if it sun's too hot you can roll them down and then a good jacket in the morning you go out and come back in the evening it can be quite cool so you need something to knock that coolness off I recommend a, a good leather shoe with a, a rubber sole similar to a tennis shoe that way you've got the warmth that you don't have with a tennis shoe plus you've got the safety so you're not going to be slipping as you're you're playing a fish or when you lean over the side of the boat to rig your lines but I definitely wear sunglasses because of the glare uh, some people like hats, I dislike them. If it does start getting nasty, I always keep a, a good parka in the boat. That way if it starts to mist rain or something, I can put the parka on and use the hood from the parka to protect my head. Okay, well I started out fishing with an open face spinning reel that I could put 15 pound test on and at least 200 yards. I found that way I could handle just about any fish that I wanted to and I matched it with an eight and a half foot rod that had a little bit of backbone, and that way I was able to uh, move the fish when I needed to, and uh, then you can just go from there and add as you go along. Probably the most important thing is you want to get that fish in a boat once you've played him, so you do need a good landing net. And it's best to buy the biggest landing net that you can find. And I found that that way when I do scoop down to pick up a fish, particularly if it's the kid's fish, you don't want to lose his fish, so you need a good landing net. Um, next thing you need is a boat that'll get you out into water 30 foot deep. It's not necessary to have a, a big boat. It helps when you have to go out a long distance, but in the fall they're in close. Uh, you can do it with a 12 foot boat. And of course, you just gauge it accordingly. You know, if it's bad weather, you wouldn't go out. One piece of equipment that you often see on coho boats, particularly, is a downrigger. Now this strange apparatus was developed to help Great Lakes anglers get their lures down deep where the hungry salmon are searching for food. Basically all it is is just a reel capable of holding 200 feet of line, of wire line, 140 pound test. It has an arm that extends out to hold the weight away from the boat. It has a cranking device so you can raise and lower the weight to whatever depth you are going to fish at. Then most importantly, it has a quick release device of some type. There's probably a dozen different releases on the market, and everyone has their own preference, but it gives you a way of taking your line down. When the fish hits, it'll pull it free from the weight, and that way you're free to play your fish without any encumbrance from a heavy weight. Well, there's been a lot of talk in fishing circles about depth finders, also called fish finders. Some people feel that without a depth finder, they don't have a chance of catching salmon. Sam, what's your opinion? It's not really necessary. In the fall, they're in close enough that usually a flat line will get them. If you don't have one, you can run it out with just strictly a line out behind the boat, maybe crimp on a little bit of shot, and it'll get you down to the 15 foot that would be necessary. Either that or if you do have the down riggers. Um, you can ask a boat fishing next to you that's catching fish. People are very helpful. They'll tell you exactly how far down they're fishing, what lure, uh, what distance back from the boat, what speed they're trolling at. So really you can go up with a minimal amount of equipment and take fish. As the summer wears on into fall, the salmon become more and more cooperative and they move into shallower water. 
but getting them hooked and into the boat requires some skill. The fishermen on a boat really have to be cooperative. Normally what we do on our boat is we try to fish at least three guys. It, sometimes it can be quite crowded, so you need one guy to maneuver the boat through the other, other boats, and you do want to follow their lines. The second guy, his job would be to pull all the other lines out of the water. A big Chinook can turn and come right back on you. They might run out 100 yards, turn, and come right back. So you want to try to get everything out of the water that's possible so it's not going to foul on your downrigger lines or foul on your other lines. And then it's more or less just hang on and man against fish for a while. Well, this fish turned out to be a medium-sized coho. But when the first fish of the day comes aboard, nobody complains. This one will be just right for barbecuing or baking. And when you catch a limit of fish like that, especially with kids aboard, that can really be a big thrill. Unfortunately, the wind kicked up that day as it sometimes does on the Great Lakes, so we had to stop our fishing. But the next day, Sam's 10-year-old boy, Dave, showed us how to catch a Chinook. We had a real battle. He'll show you, too, in just a minute. But first, here's a message from our local sponsors. Well, fishing in the Great Lakes for salmon is something you can do, women can do, even kids. You know, Sam Grissom's 10-year-old boy showed us how to catch a Chinook. You don't have to be 10 years old. You can even be younger if you have a little luck and a little help. I would say a six-year-old with help could, could take a fish. You're going to have to hang on to the rod. Uh, you're definitely going to have to hang on to the kid. Now, what I've done on my boat is I've hooked up some... Uh, all safety devices that I rigged out of a stringer that I snap onto my rods. That way I don't have to worry about my boys dropping a rod over the side. And then I just hang onto their belt just to balance them while they're manipulating the fish. And they'll get tired, but you, you help them when they need to, and then they've got the thrill, and they think that they've done it completely. Well, Dave finally got a little bit tired and turned the rod over to his dad for a while. Those little arms get tired quickly when they have to wrestle with a big Chinook. But as soon as the fish started thrashing on the surface, Dave wanted to take over again. A few fish like this would bring smiles to the faces of a lot of fishermen I know, but for a youngster, catching a fish this size is a special thrill. And you know what happens next? They get salmon fever, and they'll be bringing fish like this home every weekend. But. You know, right now you can't go out salmon fishing. You have to put that on your calendar for next spring, summer, or fall. But right now you can go ice fishing. Now, it doesn't have to take a lot of equipment either. One thing you'll need, the cheapest way to get a hole through the ice is with a spud. Chop a hole through there. You'll need a, a skimmer to keep the ice out of the hole. And you'll need, oh, some warm boots for sure. Felt packs is what I recommend. Uh, ice fishing rod, maybe with a little sneaky bobber here on the end, light line and a little hook. And for bait, well, let's say that we're going to go fishing in Saginaw Bay for perch. Well, we'd have our minnows right in this bucket. You can also use a bucket like that, to, like a larger one like this, to sit on if it isn't a small styrofoam while you're fishing. Here we are in Saginaw Bay, probably the most popular place in the state to catch perch, the yellow perch. Well, not probably, for sure. There's, oh, some 12 million perch caught in Michigan, as I recall. Uh, but out of that, two-thirds of them are caught in Lake Huron. You might think that Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, Lake Erie, uh, the other Great Lakes would produce substantial amounts of perch, but nothing like Lake Huron, especially the Saginaw Bay area. Now, it depends on the time of year. It depends on the conditions as to how deep the perch will be. Actually, the depth is, isn't the thing that's a big problem for ice fishermen. It's getting out to that water that's the problem. Uh, Saginaw Bay, oh, off Seba Wing in these areas, you might have to go out several miles. Later in the winter, February towards March, you might have to go out, oh, even eight miles to catch the perch. So you're going to need a snowmobile when the fish are that far out. But you can load up on fish. This year, there's just a new regulation put into effect for people that have taken too many perch in the past, at least in the estimation of the legislature, so they put a 50 perch daily limit for anglers. But perch are easy to catch. You just have to pay attention. When they're hitting, they'll just nibble a tiny bit, wiggle the bobber, and you can pull them up. Dandy eating fish. And that's really a great way to spend a Michigan weekend. 
beautiful out there on the ice, especially on a sunshiny day. We're going to be right back, but first here's a message from the Sporting Goods Department at Meyer. You know, racquetball is getting to be a big popular activity, and racquetball equipment is on sale this week. Racquetball is a growing sport that can help keep you in shape. It's fun, and the equipment is not expensive. This week in the Sporting Goods Department at Meyer, you can buy an MTA 4000 Pro Aluminum Racket, high sheep string cowhide grip for only $988. Or step up to the Wilson TRX-7, also aluminum construction, nylon string, raised leather grip, only $1397. And while you're there, check out the price on racquetballs. Wilson or Seamco, a can of two is only $1.97. Racquetball equipment on sale this week in the Sporting Goods Department at Meyer Thrifty Acres. Now for a little outdoor outlook. Well, first of all, we'll talk about Crystal Lake as a place you can catch lake trout. They're hitting oh, 100 to 120 feet down, usually on tip-ups. Go over near Cadillac, Lake, Lakes Mitchells and Cadillac. Uh, you can catch perch. Walleye is fair fishing right now. Houghton Lake, of course, this is the last weekend for tip-up town. That's a good place to fish. As far as perch go, Saginaw Bay, you go off Wildfowl Bay. Uh, these areas, the perch are hitting a quarter to two miles out. In some areas, they're running small, six inches. Uh, in some areas, up to a foot long. No real jumbo perch yet. And one thing you have to be careful of is the heavy snow. That's really put a kibosh on a lot of outdoor activities, so you need a snowmobile. Great place to be, the outdoors, and I hope to see you here on Michigan Weekend next week.